Hey guys, welcome to my staff room. I've got a bunch of questions here from teachers who I ran a professional learning workshop for and we had some Q&A but I drastically ran out of time to actually answer all of those questions. So here are some of the leftovers. I've got them just on my computer screen over here. I'm going to read them out and give you my best succinct answers as I can. So, the first question is, do your students do homework? Is this where they do the drill, practice, textbook stuff, so you give time in your lessons for play, etc.? So where this question comes from is that often in uh, the times when I talk to teachers, I try and emphasize that time in class needs to be used not just for, uh, here's an exercise, here's a bunch of questions you need to go through and answer them as quickly as you can, don't talk to people next to you, um, you know, that kind of interaction, which is very typical, I think, of what people picture mathematics class to be like. Now, I want to go out there first and say textbooks can be really useful, and I use textbooks all the time. I think the problem comes when we use textbooks exclusively. Um, there can be particular problems that come out, especially if you only use one textbook, and Textbooks, um, I know because they've, you know, I've got friends who've written textbooks. Um, sometimes there's a team of authors who put together a textbook, sometimes there's one or two people, and no matter how good they are or how experienced they are, if you get questions and exercises from just a single textbook, then you're going to become kind of accustomed to using or, or uh, responding to the kinds of questions that that author prefers. And hopefully they've done a good job and have given you a diverse range of questions, but um, they might tend toward the harder or the easier end of the spectrum, or they just might word their questions in a particular way. So I think it is very important to keep that balance there. If you're going to use textbooks, you should definitely have access to more than one for the sake of your student's breadth of experience. But yes, my students, to return to the original question, they do do homework. I think it's important um, to not toss out the baby with the bathwater. I know a lot of people um, are quite skeptical about using homework because often it is a waste of time. Kids are not gaining much out of just going through um, a very repetitive, long um, set of questions that don't help them develop in terms of their mathematical thinking. But that doesn't mean there aren't questions out there and places, textbooks, um, resources where if you actually think carefully, and generally I think quality here is better than quantity, um, you actually have the ability to consolidate the skills and concepts that you learn in the day in a way that's very hard to replace um, without doing it at home. I think about it this way. Mathematics is a practical subject. You've got to be able to practice the subject, that's what practical means after all, just like a musical instrument, just like a sport, it's, there's no substitute for the time that you pour into that to develop your mastery. So uh, I do encourage my students to do homework, I think that homework has to be very carefully chosen, but I think if you're a teacher out there and you're wondering should I do this or not, um, it's really a question of being careful about what it is that you ask your students to do, what you expect of them, and in particular, what is your learning intent behind the homework? If you just give questions uh, out to keep people busy, then we shouldn't be surprised that there isn't much learning gain that occurs or flows out of that. So I think it's important to have that practical, that fluency being developed so that we can develop that exploration and play and critical thinking when you're in class and you're sitting across from someone else who you can have a real mathematical conversation with. Okay, next question. It's a long one. Uh, the dispositional qualities you speak of, particularly exploration and playfulness, I think of the idea of courage. Um, that is having the heart to go on into unfamiliar or painful territory. Do you see this idea as important to the disposition of maths and leading out to resilience in general? Here's a great question. Uh, I think one of the things which is unfortunate about um, particularly how high schools do things, but this is not only restricted to high school, is that um, we sort of draw um, a, a dichotomy between academic learning and, and welfare. You know, we have our teacher welfare, and then we have all of the key learning areas that have their own um, job to do to focus on. And I think that that division is false. Um, I think in all subjects, you have the development of dispositions and uh, things like courage are hugely important in mathematics because the willingness to make mistakes, um, to take risks for something to go wrong, sometimes drastically wrong, and then to be able to pick yourself up from that, is a massively important quality for mathematicians. I remember speaking to um, some, I like to call them capital M mathematicians, people who work at universities and their job is to do research in mathematics. And I remember asking one once, you know, how often do you get things wrong? You know, a mathematician is, we sort of caricature them as persons, people who, you know, they can just do their arithmetic flawlessly and efficiently and accurately all the time and are always right constantly. That's what it looks like to be smart. But in fact, 
this mathematician's response to me was really surprising. Well, it was back then, it's not anymore. Her response was, well, I'm, I'm wrong most of the time. What makes me a mathematician is that that doesn't stop me. It makes me persevere and say, okay, well, that approach didn't work. I need to try another one. Maybe I need to talk to someone else who can give me a different kind of perspective. So I think that um, courage is a great way to summarize that. And in fact, that often makes the difference between those students who persevere and therefore develop that mathematical confidence as compared to those students who don't. Courage is a really helpful way of articulating what the difference is. This next question is related to the previous one. Um, considering dispositions, rather than confident, what about resilient? I can make mistakes and have a go again. Mistakes help me learn. Resilience leads to confidence. So uh, this question sort of relates to, uh, I referred to the Australian curriculum definition for numeracy. And one of the things that it points out is that we don't want students just to develop knowledge and skills. We also want them to develop the ability to use them confidently, and that's the word in the syllabus, uh, in the curriculum documents, I should say. Oh, I completely agree that resilience is often a precursor to confidence because uh, it is, it's an emotionally confronting experience when you get something wrong and then you get it wrong again and again, and that's not fun. And resilience is what allows you to push through that. Um, I think it's great that this question highlights the importance of making mistakes. I mean, I know I'm biased, but I don't think there's any subject like mathematics in which mistakes are more crucial and important to the development of understanding. Uh, one of the quotes I love the most from the educational researcher Dylan William is that when it comes to work that you are making mistakes in, he says, mistakes are a sign that the work I'm giving you is hard enough to make you learn. Now, I remember when I first heard him say that and it was just like a thunderbolt landed in my mind because I thought that's so self-evidently true. If you give a student uh, a worksheet with 50 questions in it and they get all of them right, they may feel really good like, woohoo, I can do these questions, but what have they learned? Probably very, very little. And so I think it is crucially important to be able to push students into that territory where they can make mistakes, where they're scaffolded enough to be able to move on from those mistakes and be able to say, okay, well, just because I can't get the answer right away, um, I have other avenues that I could try. So that resilience is a fantastically important quality that we want our mathematicians to develop. Okay, this next person has asked me a couple of questions and they're sort of related. Uh, the two questions are, how do you balance fostering the uh, these dispositions with covering content or syllabus requirements? And the second question is, how do you engage learners who have switched off to maths back in primary school? Okay, so let's tackle the first one first and we'll lead that on to the second one. So when we're talking about the dispositions, uh, in my presentation I was talking about playfulness, uh, openness, exploration, um, and uh, also creativity, teamwork, those kinds of things. And it is true, we often see uh, a kind of division between uh, tasks that help the students develop in this way uh, versus covering syllabus dot points and be able to say, okay, well today you have learned about the ambiguous case of the sign rule and I had to do that and now I can tick it off. What I would say is, uh, in a similar way to previous questions, there is a somewhat false dichotomy here between you, you tick off syllabus dot points and uh, you, you try and develop or cultivate these dispositions in your students. I think, uh, I think in New South Wales, we're very, I'm very grateful to have uh, the benefit of a syllabus document that has been very well crafted over many decades and is marvelously coherent, but importantly, provides the opportunity for students to develop those dispositions. Uh, I think we often forget because we kind of you know, in our syllabus document, we, we sort of skip past the first 15, 20 pages and we get to the syllabus content, the part that we really need to know. That's a mistake, I think, and something that characterizes that um, or exemplifies that is that in, it's the first sentence in the rationale for the K-10 mathematics syllabus that mathematics is a reasoning and creative activity. Creativity is right at the core, it's right front and center in our definition for what mathematics is. And so if what we're doing is ticking off syllabus dot points to the exclusion of the development of these dispositions, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I don't think we are actually ticking off those syllabus dot points. I think we are sort of adhering to the letter of those requirements without sort of seeing what the spirit of those things is. Why do we ask students? Why do we get them to learn calculus anyway in stage six when you're in uh, advanced and extension one, extension two? Um, it's not because those syllabus dot points have some kind of intrinsic value on their own. It's because understanding calculus among all the other fields of mathematics, 
just provides you with a perspective on understanding the world around you in a way that can be articulated symbolically, visually, uh, verbally, and that allows you to solve problems. That problem-solving disposition and that openness to seeing the world through a mathematical lens, that's the point of the syllabus door points. So if we don't convey that through the syllabus door points, I think we're missing the syllabus door points fundamentally. So I think that there has to be that tension that's struck between them. That every time you look at those syllabus door points, you ask that question, what disposition are these trying to encourage our students to have? Now the next question that was included in that one was, how do you engage learners who've switched off to math back in primary school. Well, I think one of the primary reasons why students will switch off primary or secondary um, is because there is this emphasis on those dot points to the exclusion of what's the purpose, how is this changing me as a person and developing me in my identity as a learner. I, I think that what we want to do is reconnect students to this helps you be a creative person who can solve problems in an open way and can look at the world in uh, a new light based on all of these patterns that you can see and manipulate. Um, what you want to do, I think, is so importantly to see where the student has disconnected from mathematics. And that might have been, frankly, years and years ago. And you have to start back at that point. That might be all the way back in stage one. But if you try and build, I mean, one of the great things about the mathematics curriculum that we have in New South Wales is how coherent and, and, and sort of uh, self-referential it is. It builds upon itself. And that means if you enter in at stage four, and you do not have stage three or stage two, it's really quite self-defeating to try and develop your understanding of fractions, decimals, and percentages if they haven't first got place value. You've got to go back to that point, connect students with that learning that they failed to get in the first place, either through applying it to their lives in a way that makes sense, or um, helping them, providing the scaffolds underneath that allow them to engage with it in a way that gives them success. Success is the first ingredient to engagement. And then from that point, which may take a long time, then you can actually bridge the gap to your current uh, learning needs. And that might take a long time. Uh, and that's why we have, for example, in stage five, we have the 5.1, 5.2, 5.3 structure, whereby 5.1 is specifically designed for students who have not made stage four outcomes, all of them, by the end of stage four. And you have to make that, that professional judgment of each individual student's needs as the teacher in the classroom. Okay, this next question, uh, again, relates really nicely to the last one. With maths being so reliant on prerequisite knowledge, we're seeing more and more students hit the wall sooner. Do you have any suggestions about how we can most effectively support our year seven to eight students, or even year to three to six at feeder primary schools, to prevent them falling through the cracks? Okay. So, before I directly answer that question, the first thing I want to say is, um, it's really, I'm really glad that you've put that aside in the, even year three to six at feeder primary schools. If you're a high school mathematics teacher, um, I think that while you may not say you have a responsibility to uh, work with your feeder primary schools, you may not even have feeder primary schools, depending on what kind of school system you're working within. Um, I think it's, it's a really helpful thing to help us do our job better as secondary teachers to work with um, our colleagues in primary contexts because number one, we have lots to learn from them. They do cross KLA integrated learning across disciplines much better almost always than secondary teachers. Um, but also to help those teachers have a sense of where um, high school is sort of leaning towards in a, in a positive way. I think there's all there's so much to be gained by forming that connection strongly. And in addition to that, I think it's important to recognize that there is certain work that can only be done for our students mathematically early. Um, there's certain work that you can't wait till they're 12 or 13 years old to help them develop a positive mindset about mathematics. Often that's already been decided back when they were six or seven years old and they were just starting out in their journey and either they had a great time or a terrible time and that, that really locked in their own mindset toward the subject and that becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have a kid from year three who's been telling themselves and perhaps have been told by others, you're not a maths person, you're not very good at this, then you can hardly be surprised that by the time they arrive in year seven, they have some deep mathematical scars that are very difficult to undo. So what can we do to help them? Um, I think that what's really important is to, if I could pick out one thing, is to avoid the emphasis on uh, algorithms, uh, which are often learned and memorized with very little um, actual deep understanding of why those algorithms make sense. Um, shortcuts that uh, help our students 
answer questions quickly and efficiently, but actually short circuit their mathematical concepts, we need to avoid them at all costs and replace them with a, a, a deeper conceptual framework for why these concepts make sense. So I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of things um, come up in, in number and algebra um, that are really easy heuristics, shorthands, shortcuts that our students often are told to help them learn things better, but they cause us huge problems when they arrive at year seven and eight because they have it as an algorithm, they just sort of repeat back, um, or a rule that they don't understand uh, why it is, but um, they just sort of faithfully repeat it, regurgitate it, and that causes them problems. So for example, when you subtract, the number gets smaller. Well, if you're subtracting positive numbers, the answer will be smaller, but once we introduce direct number integers in year seven and eight, um, that becomes a huge problem because when you subtract a negative number, the result is larger. Um, a very similar one in comparison is when you divide numbers, they get smaller. Well, that works with whole numbers, but if you are dividing by fractions, then, you know, five divided by a half, how many halves are there in five? And the answer is 10. That answer is not smaller. So we sometimes fall into the trap of giving our students these kind of easy shorthands, you know, uh, that, that are memorable and perhaps, you know, are nice and neat and pithy and rhyme, which helps students remember the right rule, but they kind of cause problems for conceptual understanding later on. So I think it's really important not to fall for that trap and to do that harder extra work to get the right understanding on which later learning can effectively build upon. Okay, one last question here. It's a nice lighthearted one. Apart from Twitter, where do you get your playful ideas? Uh, so in the presentation, I highlighted the fact that um, Twitter is not for me exciting because of the kind of technology it is. It's exciting because of the community that allows me to access. And there's people all around New South Wales, Australia, around the world who are doing great things um, that I would never think of in a million years, but just seeing a creative spark will often help me think, that's a great way to teach that. Why haven't I taught that way for the last 10, 15 years? Um, I should try this way, even if it's not a better way, it's a different way, and we know how important it is when you've got a class of 30 kids in front of you to have a multiplicity of teaching strategies at your disposal. Where do I go apart from Twitter? So I, I'll point out two quick ones that I like. Um, number one, I try to read as much as I can. And we have access, especially in Australia, to a huge amount of great content. Um, when I think of authors who would be particularly useful, I think of people like Adam Spencer, um, Alex Bellos, um, Steven Strogatz, you can Google all of these guys and they give you um, great uh, ideas and different, you know, even if they're not directly syllabus, syllabus connected, um, they will be mathematical concepts or ideas or um, uh, stories that will inspire you as a learner. And that's really important uh, for you to be a learner in the classroom. Your kids can tell the difference when you haven't been engaged in the active immediate learning yourself for a very long time. So um, books, I think are great. Um, in addition to that, I think that, you know, I'm a time poor teacher, parent of three, um, just like many other people out there, don't have as much time to read as I would love to. Um, so I listen to a lot of things, um, audiobooks, podcasts, there are just so many ideas out there that you can get for free or for very, very affordable prices, um, which, you know, if you go look up uh, A Brief History of Mathematics from the BBC or um, Radio Lab is a great science podcast, the ABC, um, RN has a whole bunch of podcasts that will just uh, inspire you and give you lots of different ideas that you've never heard of before. Those kinds of things are often the creative spark that give me um, lots of things to play uh, with in, in terms of um, being in the classroom. Uh, one last thing, I said two, but uh, let me add you a third one in for bonus. Um, when you look at the internet, there's heaps of great stuff out there. Probably the trickiest thing is finding what's good and what's not. Um, I love Enrich, that's kind of a classic and free resource. Um, Enrich without the E, so N-R-I-C-H dot org. Um, you've also got Math 300 if your school is able to buy a membership. Um, Brilliant dot org also is a membership based thing which has heaps of really interesting um, low floor, high ceiling tasks that are worth exploring. Um, and speaking of low floor, high ceiling, Open Middle, I don't know if it's openmiddle.com or openmiddle.org. Uh, I should have researched that beforehand, but if you look up Open Middle, there's heaps of um, questions that uh, and resources and activities that will help you be a little more playful in your classroom. So I hope that's helpful.